Introductions by Savannah Storm, then I'm going to go over protesting etiquette. That's Chris and McNeil, that is me speaking. And then afterwards, we're going to have Coolio and Zaire leading the march to the PAL and then back to the municipal building. Once that is done, we'll be doing an 8 minute and 46 second moment of silence for George Floyd at the municipal building. And then we'll be marching back here and continuing for the rest of our itinerary. Sound cool, folks? Yes! Yeah. Alrighty, folks, give it up for Savannah! Woo! Can you hear me 
Johns Hopkins, and the reason why I'm here is because I'm a teacher, specifically I teach in the Title I school, low-income, urban, diverse education, and I want to speak out on the systemic issue in regards to education because my issue with these states is they're using these test scores to determine whether our children are ready to be citizens, quote-unquote, or at risk, and we all know truly what at risk actually means. So the reason why I'm speaking here is because I've been active for a while and I really want to go over some protest etiquette in order to make sure this is as racially and culturally competent as possible. So, my first rule is, and this is specifically really for people who are not black, this protest etiquette does not make sense. Remember, this is their march, not ours. So, rule number one, do not start chants. You may join them, but you may not join all of them. Listen to the messages the organizers want to share instead of sharing your own. That goes to my point two. Some chants are not for you. Hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. Raising the black power fist. Not everything is for white folks, even those who show up in solidarity. Being choked and shot are not things happening to white folks in the same way as they are to black folks. We do not get to say it. The black power fist falls under this too. These are tied to the black experience and black resistance and are not for appropriation. Number three, stop saying things need to be peaceful and calm for you to get involved. I'm just going to say this again. This is their protest. We do not have right to be talking about how black people are feeling or invalidating those experiences. That's just simply put. Do not escalate things. Pay attention, South Plainfield. I know some of you like to pick a fight. <laughs> We're all upset, angry at these senseless and inhumane murders. That's part of why we are showing up. Even so, if you incite law enforcement, ultimately it will disproportionately harm the people of color there. Follow the organizer's lead and be willing to put yourself in front of things. Nah, be willing to put in front of yourself and things start to get heated. Use your privilege, folks. Allies to the front, there may come a time in the protest where you need to put yourself between a black person, a person of color, or someone else who is vulnerable in law enforcement or an alt-right creep. You have privilege and this is how you can use it. Grab other white folks and link arms. Make a human chain. It's going to seem scary, but this is what we need to be willing to do if it comes to that. I expect this to be peaceful, but if it comes to that, we need to use our privilege to protect the people here. Let's see, I have three more. Actually, two more. Get off your phone. You need to keep your focus on the protests and the messages that are being shared. You need to join in the chanting and be present. This is not the time to post to social media to make it about yourself. The one exception might be to document and account to a law enforcement. And finally, I strongly discourage to talk to the press. We honestly know how the press can manipulate our stories. We're trying to advocate for peace or cause. We're trying to advocate for a change that was outdated since the existence of this country. And that is all I have today, folks. But besides that, safe marching and hoorah, Tigers! Actually, one more thing. Um, in order to make sure we're accommodated to people with disabilities and health concerns, they do not have to do the march to Maple Ave. They can take safe haven here at the Venice Memorial Park. When we come back from the march from Maple Ave, we will get the rest of our friends here to march to the municipal building. Is that clear? Yeah. Is that not clear? Why isn't it clear? If I could have my dad up here, he's actually going to be leading anybody who has disabilities or is concerned about walking the distance directly to the police station. Him and my friend Mandy's mom, if they can both come up here. What? You have to speak louder. Oh. All right. Anybody who does, who has a disability or can't walk as far as everybody else does not want to participate in the march. We're going to have my father here leading everybody directly to the police station, and that's where they're going to meet us, so everybody can do the eight minutes together while we're there. Is that clear? Everybody else is going to follow Zaire, right um, and I think Chris, no, we're going to the back. Zaire right to um, directly to the Powell building, and that's the police station. Is that clear? Yeah. All right, then let's go. If you're going directly to the police station, meet my dad. He's in the giant hat right here.
Throwing up in the sky. No justice! No justice! No justice! No justice! No
Shoot! 
Thank you guys.
Tried to go through it with a smile. Go ahead, sis. Say, preach it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say the truth. They cover it up. They cover everything up. But we're here to bring our voice to it. We're here to say that it's not, it's there. It's everywhere. Especially here. Racism isn't here today. It's not. But today we came together, put our voices together. Give the silence a voice. So today is the start. It's just a, a little step. For you today, all the emotions that's going through your head today, keep that in mind every day. Because we're still fighting. This is not, this is not the stop. Don't forget it. Today is just the one step, one small step. We have so much more to accomplish. We have so much more to see. So today we not only made a change in South Plainfield, but we made a change everywhere. This is this, this is our small voice. That can change everything. So don't forget what we did here at all. Because this is our future. This is our kids' future. We want to raise them in a place that we want to we wanna love. They need to love it too. So exactly, keep in mind that we still have a, a long way to go. We still got to fight to fight. So, Black Lives Matter. Hi everybody. Um, I again want to say thank you to everybody coming out and support. It means a lot. Um, I know me as a black person, I've been going through a lot of like anxiety and like not being able to sleep at night just because every time I open up Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Reddit, this that and third, I'm always seeing someone who looks like me being brutally murdered, brutally mistreated. And um, June now is Pride Month, so I want to say happy Pride to all the people in the LGBTQ community. All the allies, this and third. I also want to take a minute to, to um, recognize the death of Tony Dade, a trans man who was killed, and um, the coverage is constantly misgendering him, ignoring his trans identity, this and the third. And I want to say we must we must recognize all our people. And um, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I've realized that like growing up being black and gay was hard. It's hard being gay, period, because a lot of people are homophobic. They believe that you're wrong, this, that, and the third. And it's also being, it's hard being black as well, because as we all know, we're, all, we're here trying to say that our skin color is not a crime. We are not wrong for existing. Our existence is right, it's true. But it's also hard being black and queer, period. Because in the black community, as a lot of us know, there's a lot of hush-hush about the situation, a lot of homophobia, because for whatever reason it is, but I just want to speak about it. I had a hard time growing up. Um, my family was not the most supportive at all. I had issues. I had to like not be at home for an extended period of time. Um, when I moved away, things got a lot better. When I went to college, and then coming back in the pandemic, a lot of things just like reignited themselves. And I just wanted to bring attention to people in the black community. We have to, we have to, we have to advocate for all lives. All black lives matter. Black queer lives, black trans lives, all of it. Because if you're only only advocating for black cis and heterosexual lives, you want privilege, not equality. And it's important for us to know that all of us matter. 
black queer people, black men, black trans women are at the forefront of all these protests, doing the most that we can because that's all we can do. That's all we know how to do is stick up for ourselves. And to people in the queer community, there's, a bad, there's bad racism. And I, it honestly doesn't make sense to me because black, queer, trans women are the people at the forefront of all the protests for our rights. We got all of our rights from Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia, Sylvia Rodriguez. We need to speak up for everybody. We cannot just, we cannot just speak up for real life or cis, cisgender straight lives because that's not how it works. We need to respect all black lives. We all matter. That's all I have to say. not here. I want you to go back through every conversation that they said they were for you and they're not here. Say it, brother. I, I, want, I want you to remember that you cannot say all lives matter by skipping over the value of a black life. Period. I want you to remember that each one of you have value. I am so proud of you guys. I'm proud to see that you, the generation behind me, refuse to inherit a world broken by your forefathers. I'm glad that you're standing together beyond race, creed, color, gender, whatever it is, and saying, this is not the world we want. I got good news for you. The good book agrees with you. That where there is injustice, you should speak up. And here's what I want you to do. Very simple. Yeah, register to vote. But I need your help here in South Plainfield. Here's the action step. Campaign Zero has a list of police reforms that can be adopted in every local town. So after we finish Black Lives Matter, after we finish Don't Kill Us, Stop Killing Us, after we finish all of this, what we need to do is make sure the mayor, the chief of police, and the city council adopts reforms that say and value Black Lives Matter. Now you don't have to be in the church to say amen to that. Because that's what we need. We at Impact Church, we're here with you. We need you. We're going to put this petition out. I hope that you will sign it. I hope you will join us in every public forum. We cannot let them forget it. We cannot let them go. We have to say at least in this one town, and then the next town, then South Plainfield, then North Plainfield, then Plainfield, then we take it to the state. One last thing I need you to do, I need you to do this. We gotta have the strength to find our voices in private spaces. Yes. Stop playing diplomatic. Stop playing nice. Stop, stop trying to have a, a, everybody you're afraid. You're gonna have to disrupt some people. You have to call out truth. This is not about racial truth. It's just about truth. Truth is truth. Speak the truth. When you go to work, protest and resist. There's pay inequity at the job you're working at. Speak up and say it. Be willing to lose your paycheck over it. Say it. Say, I want more. When you see people being discriminated against because they won't be hired because there's a certain class of people, say not at this workplace. Make them hire somebody else. If you go to class and the professor says something racist, walk out. Yes. Stop paying your tuition. In other words, we gotta keep resisting in every realm, even the church. It's time out for black church, white church, and everybody go back to the nice corner. There's only one God who made people of all color. Last thing, stop saying you don't see color. It's an incrimination of your ignorance. We are made with different colors and creeds for a reason. I'm a musician. To make a chord, you need three notes. Each note is different. That's called harmony. If we want harmony in America, we have to stop saying silly, stupid, ignorant things like, I don't see color. Yeah. You seeing color is not the issue. You judging based upon it is. Yeah. So tell your friends. Speak to your bosses. Speak to everyone you know. 
You say, I'm a human being, and I support human rights, and that's why I stand with black lives. Y'all keep this up. Proud of you. You're the next generation. You're the hope. I love you. You've encouraged me. I'm proud of you. 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 Come on, give it up. Thank you. Round of applause, team. I'd like to bring our keynote speaker, Khalil, to the floor. That's good. How's everybody doing? Everybody got some water? That was a long march, wasn't it? God is working, ain't he? I just want to say, I never thought this would happen in South Plainfield. I, I was sitting in my room, and I saw the, the notices on my Instagram time out everybody else. Edison was having something with Brunswick, Plainfield, Franklin, Piscataway. And I said, well, actually, Malcolm actually did me first and said, well, South Plainfield not having one? I said, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. As far as I know, no. Then about a day later, Chris DM me and said, hey, me and Savannah talked to the mayor, we talked to the chief, we want to have something, we want to get this together, but we need your help. We need help organizing, we want to make sure we do this right, because we're your allies, but we're here for you. Black Lives Matter is for you. So we want to help you put this together, we want to do it, you know, in the right way. So I said, sure, we're going to put this together, we're going to do it right. So I want to thank everybody for coming out. First and foremost, you guys, you made your impact on this community. So I think I've never seen anything like this. Marching yeah. on Maple Avenue, screaming Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Screaming, say his name. What's his name? George Floyd. Screaming, say her name. What's her name? Taylor. Never seen nothing like this. This is history. Yeah. Just take it in. Take this moment to recognize you broke history. In, in this town, to hold the municipal building, to kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds in the honor of George Floyd, it's history. So I want everybody just to kind of take that moment in. I want to thank the mayor. I know he might not be here, but I want to thank him for allowing us to do this. We've cooperated and let us peacefully demonstrate and protest. We have to respect those who hold the office and are going to work with us. So we got to work with them. You know, we can't do it just on our own, but we do have to come together on our own come up with what we want, and when we want it, make our demands, and hopefully we can meet somewhere in the middle, which is what happened today. We marched down Maple Avenue, we've come here, we're gonna have some speakers, we're gonna have uh, another pastor, my pastor, Reverend Howard, is gonna come and give us a blessing and a word. We have a couple South Plainfield High School alumni and students who wanna share some words with you. Um, so I just wanna bring that to the forefront. This was put together by South Plainfield High School alumni and students. It's huge, it's huge. It starts with us, but we also need the help of all of our elders who have been teaching us and guiding us and giving us the courage to come out and have these platforms and speak these words. You know, I've been seeing a lot of things on social media. Somebody said, uh, we're still crying tears over Emmett Till. They think it's about George Floyd, but we're still crying tears over Emmett Till. And I thought that, that struck a chord with me. Because a lot of times we get caught up in these moments and these movements and it becomes just a moment. I don't want this to be a moment. I want this to be something that we just keep going. Keep going, we don't gotta stop. Just keep going. You know, there's an attitude to me in this neighborhood somewhat in our country of, oh, that can't be us. Yeah. You know, we have an attitude where, oh, famine? We don't have famines here, that can't be us. War-torn countries with people who are starving and brutalized and raped and murdered, that can't be us, that's not us, that's not the narrative. We have this idea that we don't, we don't live in a place like that. 2020 has showed up and said, it can be you. You can have a global health crisis affect you. Hundreds of thousands of people sick and dying. You can face war-torn cities and streets. You know, I don't, I don't condone violence, but it happened. You can face persecution and oppressed people. You have to speak up for them and make sure your voice is heard. So it can be you. A lot of my white colleagues and friends and other races too, but they tend to ask me when things like this happen because they know who I am. So like, what do you think about that? You see the marching and the protesting, you see you know, Trayvon Martin kills, Eric on in the street, George Floyd, too. what do you think about that? And I think that's an insensitive question. How do you start with what do I think about that? Because before I think anything, I feel. Before I think about what happened to Trayvon Martin, or think about what's going on with George Floyd, or think about what this means for our future, I feel it, I'm a black man. 
from the moment I'm born, I'm told it can be you. You can be shot by the wrong person being in the wrong place. You can be pulled over and arrested and taken to a place where you may be tortured and not given your equal opportunity and equal rights to fight for your justice. So it can be you. But I want us all to realize that, again, 2020 has come to us, it can be us. We can be the negative, but also be the positive. We can do the change. I, I never thought I'd see something where it said all 50 states yeah. had protests and marches yeah. and people getting together. 18 countries. 50 states and 18 countries for us? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So yes, it could be us, we could be affected by all the negative things in the world, but we could also be changed. We could also be changed. So it can be you. Do not go around having this attitude where, oh, that can't be us. That's not in our neighborhood. Racism, it doesn't live here. But I haven't been really vocal about it until Ahmaud Arbery got it. It really, it really hurt my heart. Because why should I be scared to go on a jog with a fear that it won't finish? And I stutter a lot, but Every speech I have, it has a prompt, and this one is, history has its eyes on it. I'm sure quite a few of you know what a main character is, and I'm sure that people count themselves as the main character. Maybe of your own story, or maybe of someone else's. But when was the last time you saw a main character completely silent on other things? When was the last time you saw that main character scroll through their social media and roll their eyes at all the black screens for a movement that doesn't affect them? When was the last time you saw a main character take a break from social media because they didn't want to acknowledge the hurt and injustice going on in the world? You call yourself the main character of your story, but you're sitting on your couch with your grandchildren on, at your knees asking you what side of history you are on. You know that they would be disappointed. A main character is a hero. A main character isn't a threat. A main character may be plain or basic, they will still stick up for others. A main character knows they're on the right side of history. You want to be painted as a good person, but silent on the issues in the world makes you a loser. You don't have to be constantly performative, but I never see a black screen out of you. And I never see a hashtag out of you. You have a large following, so why aren't you using your platform to help end this inequality so you don't have to keep hearing about little black boys shot in the head? You don't have to hear about the black deaths anymore because you helped to do something to fix it. Now, activism isn't always performative, but when you are actively ignoring the problem, you'll become a part of the problem. It may make you feel better because you didn't say anything all week, but you posted a black screen on Black Tuesday to get praise from your neutral. Anti-racism and Black Lives Matter is expected out of you and not praised. An innocent man with a family died on hot concrete with a police officer's knee on his neck. Black bodies are staying in the streets with blood, and you are still posting pictures how was my best? Read the room. You're upset because the world is burning, but you are upset, uh, upset at why it's burning. Ending police brutality and racial injustice should be top priority for you. It's not getting political. It's human rights you are expected to fight for. A life isn't a trend or a debate. It's a human life. It isn't human lives ending because of their skin color. It isn't controversial. It's something we are fighting against. You aren't doing anything to fix it so the world stops burning. You have chosen the wrong side of history and you are not the main character. You are a stunt double at most. Your ancestors brought us here, enslaved us, raped us, lynched us, segregated us, and now you think we have our freedom, but we don't. Don't live up to your ancestors and do better. And if you think the black people are free or happy to be in this country, you are wrong. Some of us can't finish a job without being shot at. Some of us can't go to the store and buy skills and an iced tea, and some of us can't sit in our cars on the day we're getting married without being killed. Ahmaud Arbery, Trayvon Martin, and Sean Bell, young black men that didn't get to do that. Their lives ended. They weren't just killed. Their lives were ended before they had really begun. They don't get to put their toes in the sand at the beach anymore. You still get to have that feeling. They don't get to have any more second chances or even first. No more phone calls, memories, or conversations with them. No more silly injuries when being reckless that they have a cool story behind a weird shaped scar for. No more those are the things that you take for granted in life once you realize it's about to end. And these lives end because of your skin color. Now you get it. You get the fear, anger, and frustration that comes with being black. We don't get to listen to Sandy speak anymore because Sandra Bland was beaten to death by an officer after a traffic stop and blamed for her own death. That officer is walking free. In fact, almost every police officer that has killed a black person for no reason is walking free. Cops aren't held accountable for their actions because we heard the rule all of silence or call qualified immunity. Those rules are the exact reason we are scared of police. We are practically ready to get murdered for them to get away with 
racism gone through that has gone throughout this high school that have constantly been ignored and I honestly chose to take a stand this year and expose some of those racist acts. I mean yeah I lost some Snapchat followers or Instagram followers but in the end who cares? Because if those people unfollow you for standing up for your own skin tone and who you are then I promise you, they weren't really a friend to begin with. So we were yeah. Using the platform that I have right now, I would just like to shine light onto the South Central school system. We, a lot of people here have seen racist acts that have gone on recently in the South Central High School and other racist acts and things that people have said in this town. And honestly, we've seen no response to what has happened because not only to black people alone, but people of color. People have said things that are just flat out hurtful. Things like, go back to your country, or if I see another Asian person wearing a mask, they shouldn't because basically they brought the coronavirus here. Things like this should not go on and just be slid under the rug by a South Bank School District. We brought light to these things like this, and we've seen no consequence to the people who said it. Most people are just basically get some social media slander and they just get the free pass. And I honestly think that it's just wrong for them to get the free pass for saying racist acts and no consequence happening. Honestly, in South Plainfield, it seems like they don't care about our skin tone. I mean, you could go ahead and um, see examples of a black person saying the N-word to another black person and then getting three days suspension from the South Central School District. But having a white person say the N-word to another black person, and just, they look it off like it just never happened before. Yeah. Yeah. It makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense that some supporters can wear their Make America Great Again t-shirts in the high school, but then when children in my school try to wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts, they tell them that they can't. So basically what I want to say is that I know I haven't been the perfect activist for uh, Black Lives Matter and then people in color in, in general, 
but starting with this movement, starting this year, starting today, right here, right now, I know that I'm making a change and that I want to make a change and I want this, this community, this country, and just in general, to be better for the next person of color who has to live through throughout this place their whole life. I also want to say thank you for everyone who came out today. I know a lot of people have to go home and just deal with different things right now, but living in South Philly my whole life, I would have never thought that we'd be able to make this happen. In the preliminary stages of this, a lot of people were like, all oh, these people just want to protest and riot, uh, barricade your houses because they're going to riot, destroy the town or whatever. And those people are honestly just ignorant and don't know what we stand for as a Black Lives Matter movement and just protesting in general. They don't know the the meaning behind protest and the true history behind protest. Because if you look in American history, protest is in our blood, it's just in our blood and DNA. We protest for everything. The Boston Tea Party, like, you can go ahead and look up, go on Twitter, you just, Twitter, go, scroll through, scroll through. You can see white people protesting because the Eagles won the football championship, because their sports team lost, and then when we want to protest for the color of our skin, we're in the wrong here. It makes no sense. Yeah. So basically, I just want to thank you for coming out today. Because honestly, not in my wildest dreams, I would never imagine this happening in South Plainfield. And that we are a part of a change here. And that we are starting something different in this community. We are starting a new legacy in South Plainfield. Accepting everyone for who they are, no matter skin tone, color, race, belief, sexuality, no matter what. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. That was great. Right, right, right. Activism like charity starts at home. It starts at home. It starts when we all come together. And we talk to one another, we talk to our friends, we talk to people who might not be our friends. Who may have some words for us, but we let them know that's not right. We come together and we make our voice heard. So charity and activism start right here at home. So if you can't do it in your hometown, where else can you do it? Uh, Lene, I believe Lene wanted to come up and share some words with us. Where are you? Right behind, right behind. Um, my name is Lene A. Ali. I'd like to say the A in the Um, I've been a South Dakota resident for over 15 years now. I graduated from SPHS in 2017. I have six siblings, three who have gone through the SPHS school system, three who are currently going through the system. Um, I attend and work at Impact Church in town, and I am a student working on my degree in criminal justice. So a movie that's had a profound impact on my life is Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. Hey. Towards the end of the movie, there's a scene where one of the characters, Radio Rahim, is in a chokehold by three white police officers, and he's struggling to breathe. The community is pleading with the officers to stop and let him go, but the officers ignore their request, and this results in Radio Rahim's death. Mookie, Spike Lee's character in the movie, responds angrily as he throws a garbage can through his workplace, Sal's Pizzeria, which sparks rioting, and the pizzeria gets burned down. After this is done, Mookie contemplates whether or not he did the right thing, but I wonder if it's more important to ask why his reaction was anger rather than condemn, condemn him for his anger. Today, I want everyone to leave with the qualities of active listening, critical thinking, and empathy for others. Similar to Spike Lee's story, there is a listening problem in our society. So today, I'm asking you to listen instead of judge and empathize with me about an experience that only I and black people can know about. A few years back, I posted a picture of myself um, with the caption, because black is beautiful on social media. And the responses I received for the most part were positive, but there was this one comment in particular that threw me off guard. The comment read, actually, all shades are beautiful. Think about this. In response to my confidence and my pride as a black woman, someone's response was, actually, all shades are beautiful. We live in a time where people have a problem recognizing that black lives matter too. And we must recognize that so long as lives are treated, black lives are treated this way, all lives matter is just a platitude statement. So now I offer you the same words that I offered two years ago. Are you aware of the insecurities that people of color and black people 
more specifically black girls face in the community because their beauty is not of the norm? Do you know what it's like for someone to tell you that your skin color is too dark or not light enough? For someone to make you feel worth less than what you are over the color of your skin? For you to say all shades are beautiful or all lives matter undermines the message that black lives matter too. The truth is we live in a society that does not value black lives, that continuously perceives black lives as less significant. The news of Ahmad, George, and Brianna was alarming and shocking to you, to those of you who are not of color. But to us, this was our reality. This is what waking up black feels like every day. We have to worry about whether or not we're too black. We have to question our identity because black people, for some reason, can be black and articulate. Yes. We have to constantly prepare ourselves to not do anything that would attract the attention of those in law enforcement. We have to subdue our blackness in order to get a job. We have to be overly cautious in our travel as anti-black hate groups still thrive in this country. We can't touch things in the store without being accused of stealing. We can't. We always have to be on our best behavior. We can't. This is our reality. Yes. The question we're all grappling with is, when is enough enough? When does black stop, being, stop making us a target here? Because of the late 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, I know that it is not safe to walk down the street with a pack of Skittles while being black. Because of Breonna Taylor, I know that it is not safe to sleep in the comfort of my own home while being black. Because of Ahmaud Arbery, I know that it is not safe to jog while black in my own community without being seen as a criminal. Because of Sandra Bland, I know that it is not safe to drive and be pulled over while black, and therefore my anxiety shoots through the roof whenever I'm in the car, and I'm afraid to be pulled over. It terrifies me. Because of George Floyd, I know that it is not enough to simply comply with the police while being black. He said, I can't breathe 16 times, and he cried for his dead mother, and his words were still ignored. I don't feel safe being black in America, and that should never be the case because of those names and so many more. There needs to be a change. We need to start holding people in power accountable for what they do and what they say. How do we start? I didn't have a voice at all. I sat there, I took everything, I let everything just slide underneath the table. My junior and senior year, I decided that it was my time to stand and bring my voice to life. I decided to make my voice heard in the community of South Hampton. My senior year, it was time for our senior painting in the hallway. So I tried to paint something relatable to me, a black superhero. So everybody else that painted white superheroes were able to get their painting, their painting like accepted early. It would pass through earlier than mine. It took me two more weeks before everybody started in order to get mine approved because they were black superheroes. So after that day, I decided it was time for me to stand up to South Central High School. Everything since then, I stood up to all the black people in the school and showed them that they have rights too. So today, we showed the town that we're here and we have our voice and that we matter. So from here on out, we will show them that we do matter to them and then this does exist in their school system. And it's time for them to make a change. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Logan, thank you. And I love that black superhero. I walked to high school last year, I saw the black superhero. I love the black superhero. I appreciate that. Thank you for saying that for that. Jason wanted to come up and give us some more words. Uh, please speak up. I know your voice is tired from leading us in the march, but say what you want to say. Thank you, thank you. My name is Jason Wortham, and I've lived here in South Korea for most of my life. I'm black, I'm proud, but I'm tired and I'm scared. I've been scared all my life. That fear when you're driving in a rough neighborhood, quote unquote, but for me it's the entire country. Everywhere I go I'm in danger, simply because of the color of my skin. I look at a cop and I don't relax and feel safe. I tense up and pray they don't mess with me. 
Way before George Floyd was murdered, me and my brothers had feared for our lives for when being confronted by cops. We were all trained to act and talk a certain way in front of cops, all of us. Late at night, breaking news, another unarmed black male shot dead by those who are supposed to protect us. My parents called me to the living room to have that conversation. All the black people, you know what I'm talking about. That conversation started as early as I can remember, instilled in every black person in front of you today. Educated so we don't get killed, a reality that we all have to live every single day. When I saw the video of George Floyd, I was heartbroken, but not surprised. And the only thing I can think was, am I next? Are one of my brothers standing in front of you next? Are we the next hashtag, the next death without any justice? A sick thought for someone in a country that claims to be the land of the free. The Black Lives Matter movement is nothing but education, opening everybody's eyes to the mistreatment my people live. We're tired of sitting back and letting things slide. It took showing the whole world on camera during a global pandemic the injustice we face. It took that to finally see a reaction by people we need, needed help long ago. To finally feel like we have someone else on our side. Am I upset it's taken this long? Yes, but I'm grateful it's happened now. My father asked me, what do you think needs to be done to really make a change? And my first answer was regular police screening. I do strongly believe that there are good cops in this world trying to make it a better place. But there are way too many bad apples in the bunch. I know y'all seen a lot of posts about bad apples being in the bunch. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, this is not the type of job that needs bad apples. That's like a pilot. Bad apples. Some of them feel like they want to land. You take your pick. Do you have faith in that airline? No. So I don't have faith in the police force. If there's that many bad apples killing us. But there are, I saw a post that said, it takes longer to learn how to be a barber than a cop. Let that sink in. A barber, people. I can learn how to cut hair or learn how to be a cop quicker. Police officers' personalities should be checked. We know they all have the ability to police the streets, but is their personalities right? Is their heart in the right place? There is no excuse why cops should be giving a little slap on the wrist for conducting an arrest in a brutal way. Hold them accountable. I'm tired of cops killing unarmed black civilians without receiving any punishment, unless the internet says different. There should be no reason why Twitter and Instagram are more of a justice system than our actual justice system. That doesn't make sense to me. Why do we have to for Twitter and Instagram? That's ran by us. Come on now. Power to the people, but we try to trust people in the justice system? Come on. Come on now. Come on now. My second answer to my father's question was, educate people while they are young. In high school, I remember in my history class, we spoke about slavery. And this had to be my freshman year. This was the first time graphic videos were going to be shown to our grade. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. We went to the high school. But before the video was shown, the teacher said, if anyone feels uncomfortable, you can leave and go to another classroom. Come to my surprise, a couple of students left the room. In essence, allowing students to walk away from the reality that once was, or still is. While we are young, videos of America's sin should be shown to every one of us. The reality that my ancestors were thrown off boats in the middle of the ocean with weights tied around their ankles. The reality that my ancestors were lynched in front of the whole town, killed for sport. The reality that this isn't, that this, this didn't happen too long ago. I know they had a lot of black and white photos in the history book, trying to show us and still in our minds that it happened a long time ago, a really, really long time ago. 
my great great grandfather was a slave. That's two greats, people. That's only two greats. That's not too long ago. The reality I had to face way before being taught in high school, traumatizing for me as a young boy. And yes, it may be traumatizing for every high schooler who views it, black or white, but it'll mean something that, but it'll be something that they will never forget. I saw a post on Twitter, this white mom said on, on Nickelodeon, they were sharing, um, they had an ad about George Floyd saying, I can't breathe. And she was pissed. She's like, uh-uh, not my child. He's not gonna see this. This is a young boy, he's gonna be traumatized. My son, Nickelodeon, shame on you. I responded back, I said, at that age, mind you, the kid was eight years old. At that age, I was having a conversation with my parents about what to do and what not to do in front of a cop, so I don't die. An eight-year-old kid, you gotta go to an eight-year-old black kid and tell them, you are going to die if you don't act right in front of a cop. That's the reality, that's the truth. And you feel bad about your young son who doesn't have to face that same type of attention from cops that target on my back everywhere I go. I can't look at nobody wrong, I keep my head down. Going to a store, a young lady said, can't put my hands on nothing. That's my reality. That boy would not face that type of reality. Now I see a lot of faces out there, a lot of people I graduated with and went to school with. And I did notice that a lot of you have children and I pray, I pray you plan to teach them to see people of every shade, accept them and love them from who they are. We must, we must pass love on to the next generation. Teach them what's right. We know what's right. We know what's right. Stop pretending that, oh, uh, okay. We'll let it, we'll let it you know, fly by, whatever. No, 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 we know what's right. And you gotta teach them when they're young. You have to. After we leave today, don't let this just be another hangout or opportunity to catch up with people you haven't seen in years. Or people you We fight for all of us. Hispanic people, Indian people, Asian people, y'all in it with us, trust me. It says Black Lives Matter, but trust me, y'all in it. It's back to history that y'all came over as a pawn. You're a pawn, that's it. Make a difference. Stop letting things slide. It starts in the private conversations, like I said over there. Those little hangouts you have with your group of friends. If someone says out of line, confront them. That was wrong. That wasn't cool, I didn't like that. And let them know, because that's gonna be seared in their brain. Okay, I can't talk about that like that. You know, I have to change my thinking. That wasn't cool. Stop using the phrase, oh, I have black friends. Come on now. Oh, I got black friends. I'm not racist. That's not valid. Thank you, brother. That's not valid. Racism is a way of thinking. And racism was taught. We did not grow up with racism in our book. No, no. That was taught. White people, this is kind of hard. I know. I know. It's kind of hard because you're going to have some hard decisions and hard conversations you're gonna have. And I feel bad for if you're in a family that believes in that kind of stuff. That's your family, I get it. But if that's your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, saying things out of line, I don't care. Say something. Uncle Tom, that wasn't right. Aunt uh, Janet, that wasn't right. That wasn't cool, I didn't like the way you said that. That's all it takes. Don't let them slide by, just okay, whatever. And I said teach them young because they grow up with that instilled in Same thing with the, the people going out of the classroom, not facing reality and kind of just ignoring it. They're gonna grow up one day with that in their head. Oh, I could walk away from it. We can't, we can't walk away from it. I can't be one day, okay, you know what, let me decide to be another shade of skin tone, what you know what I'm saying, like, 
I ain't gonna be black today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do me. But doing me gets me shot. Doing me gets me killed. I can't go on the beach and just chill out. I gotta watch over my shoulder. Even at parties, I gotta watch myself. Bunch of cops come by in the front. Who is it? What's all this noise coming from? Everybody leaving the, everybody leaving the house. Oh my gosh, cops coming. They gonna see the first black person and be like, you, come here. We see it time and time again. I'm tired of it. And it don't take much to take a person down. It's four people and one person. George Floyd, one person. I saw a post that someone said, oh, the city of so-and-so. We're outnumbered, the police, four to one. George Floyd was outnumbered four to one. How you feel? Four people taking down one person. Really, it takes that much? All this training y'all seen to go through? It take that much to take down one person? And that was a grown man. This kid's getting killed. Come on now. I saw a video of a little black girl, and all I could think of was my, my little sister. She was at some kind of party, whatever. This, this cop is throwing her down, just throwing her down, trying to cover her up. Like, what? Come on. I don't want to hear all that. I'm tired of it. I'm tired. I am tired. Had a conversation with my bro, Malcolm over there. We were on the phone, like, he said, I'm tired. Dude, I feel you. I feel, we all feel, we're tired. I am exhausted. I can't sleep at night. Knowing that the next time I go for a ride, I might die. I, I just might die. The percentage of me going out, it's pretty high. I see my boy Marvin, we went for, uh, right here in South Plainfield. We went to the McDonald's on Oak Tree, y'all know what I'm talking about. Late at night, I never forget this, never. We went, got some food. I got some food, you know, I love McDonald's. But, but I got some food. He didn't get some food, he was like, all right, cool. We got some food, we left. We're going down. Now, me trying to be safe. I'm trying to be safe. I'm trying to eat and drive. A lot of people know what that, yeah, uh-huh. A lot of people know that could be an accident waiting to happen. But you know what, I said, you know what, there's too much food, I can't drive and eat. Marvin, would you mind switching with me? So we stopped on the side a little bit, got out the car, we switched. Simple as that. Marvin got in the driver's seat, I got a passenger seat just to, just to eat my food. Not even a block away, not even a block. A cop. I said, what we do? We literally just, I don't mean like five, you know what I mean? Like we just drove a little bit. Cop said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine, what's up? Is this your car? Talking to Marvin. Marvin's like, no, this is his car. He said, so why are you driving? So, oh, you know, he had to get food. Mind you, he's talking to the cop. Another cop on this side, passenger seat. Whoa. Okay, I don't jump, I don't make any sudden moves. And before they came to the car, what do we do? We pull out the license registration. Black people, you know what I'm talking about? You put your hands up. You let them see your hands real quick. Cause you know, any sudden moves, that's it, lights out. I had the food between my legs, and I put my hands up, I didn't move. Cops still looking at me, he don't say anything over there. He's still talking to Marvin. They leave, they come back. Oh yeah, we got a complaint from somebody saying that you were causing a disturbance. How, we just, we just switched. We didn't say anything, we, didn't, we weren't screaming, nothing. But you know what, I didn't say that. Why, because my mama didn't raise me like that. She said, just comply. Just comply, yes officer and try to keep it moving. But no, it prolonged more and more. So I'm looking at Marvin, why would you rest for disturbing the people, what? Seriously? They come back to the car. Of course, the officer over here, hey, what you eating, man? What does it matter what I'm eating? I'm eating a McChicken. Oh, I'm trying to. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying, I'm just trying to eat. Peacefully, peacefully, just trying to eat. 
I still got my hands up. He's like, oh no, it's okay. You go ahead and grab a fry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Look, he already knew it. I didn't have to tell him. You knew it. You knew it. You knew it. Y'all knew it. Y'all knew it. To set up. One fry could cost me my life. A fry. Nothing in my car. A fry. Imagine that. If I picked up a fry. Boom. Hashtag RIP Jason Jordan. Jordan Jason Wortham. Boom! Another unarmed black man, dead. That's it. Lights out. And that was years back. Another one, didn't finish college. Another family lost their son. Another sister lost her brother. Another friend lost another black male. Friend. Come on now. It's time to change, people. It's time to change. That's my reality. If y'all never experienced that, understand something. That is my reality. That's all we're saying. We're not trying to force y'all to do something. We're not trying to force y'all. We're trying to wake y'all up. Just trying to wake y'all up. That's it. It don't take much. <sighs> Teach the young people. Teach the young. Listen, we must do better. And we will do better. Be safe and stand up for what you would, what you know is right. Right is right, wrong is wrong. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Nadira Walter Williams. I grew up, my roots are in Newark, New Jersey. My parents moved to Plainfield when I was three. I went to Hubbard Middle School. Um, Cedarbrook Elementary School, Evergreen Elementary School. I split my time between these two places. I just feel it's important to constantly be reminded that change begins and ends with as far as you're about to take it. There are more than two political parties. It's not just Democrat and Republican. You can do your research. You can know, understand your history. No one here is the first black person to ever live in Plainfield. It's happened before, like changes have been made before, and I feel there's this, I always hated living here, uh, because I feel like suburbia has a way of like trapping you in this small town thing. Like it's just very tight, but there's, you need to know your history, as in who are the Fannie Lou Hamers who came before you here, who who pushed the boundaries here? And also, let's just be mindful of who our city council people are. Who do you want to be your city council people? Do you consider yourself a potential city council person or something? And we can, before we subvert the government that exists and defund 12, if you're of that mind, even though they were very helpful today, right? But still, Infrastructurally, this is a system that began with slave patrol. Police could not exist if it weren't for the history of slave patrol. Put in place to mind your behavior as a person of color. So it hasn't changed much. They're still doing their job. Do you like their job? Does that work for you? What are you gonna do about it? Do you know just, I think it's important that we ask ourselves, what is the annual budget that's allotted for the police force in South Plainfield? In Plainfield, how much is allotted to public safe, public health and safety, community, education? They've been defunding the police. I'm sure some of you saw that tweet. Defunding the police sounds radical until you take into account that they've been defunding education for years. When just two years ago, they were petitioning for school books to tell you that that footnote about slavery, it was actually a bunch of helpers that were on a boat and they were like on a crew. It's that radical, it's that crazy. And you need to be that radical with your politics, with your beliefs. Every brand that waited past what, George Floyd was the martyr. He passed away on the 25th. 
I didn't see several brands speak till the 31st. I was mad on the 27th. Like real mad, big mad. Mad enough to do something. But the, every brand, every ally, every ambassador, everyone in this young girl Instagram archetype, this neo-capitalist thing, they are not all allies. They watch where you're putting your money as well. I understand that the bagel place that donated these bagels is they're Palestinian. These are people, people who support community movement and what you want. Solidarity with our allies, with people of color, let's start speaking to each other again. In public, yeah, I don't know you, but say hello to me. Why yeah. can't you do that anyway? But, <laughs> or we talk. So, but, you know, it, we're not, we can no longer be strangers. We, technology has advanced humanity. Things have advanced people. And that cannot persist if this is going to be a solid movement. Yes, protests will sustain for a little while, but that's a small piece of what really has to happen. And it's about mobilization and coming together and putting your money mindfully, pouring into your own communities. And when you don't see those things existing, making it happen. You know, like we know Home Depot is not, is not for you. Financially, where they put their money, where they invest, Lowe's gave back to minority communities, but even so, we have to get out of this capitalist mentality that everyone has to be a CEO or like something crazy, a pop star or something to change the world. I know I'm an actor, but I don't, I don't know, I don't know, but like, I just mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could say, oh yeah, I know that the, the guy who runs the hardware store down the street, he is of color. And I know he'll he'll help us out. Like he, I know he'll help us build stuff. You don't have to be someone who doesn't look like you. What they tell you you need to be in order to make a huge impact. And you know, I'm not here to soapbox, but I just think it's important to maintain your movement, maintain your collective, your community. And understand, there's such a deep-seated fear in communities of color, sometimes, of going outside of our comfort, of getting to know things differently, of security. But we need to surpass those things in order to, be, to gain momentum and become stronger. There is no place for the fear. It's about how you walk into a room, how you command your presence, how you speak, how you hold yourself, where you put your money, where you put your eyes, your time. You could binge watch another MTV, God knows what, or watch The Real Housewives. Andy Cohen didn't say anything until about the 31st and it was definitely obligatory. You could do that. Or you could read about t -com which is a neo-Marxist movement. They have a book, Introduction to Civil War, which we're in one. And it's insidious. It's not outright armed all the time. But in southern places, in many places, there are men showing up who are not affiliated with any federal organization, who are not government officials, who we no longer trust with guns. But these men, these civilians, are armed. And they are occupying protest spaces just to make sure everything's good. I don't know if anyone here, you don't have to want to use a gun to understand ways you can protect yourself. It's important to be able to do so when your life is threatened. And it would be silly of us moving forward to not look at movements like the Young Lord and the Black Panthers who were doing this work and who were doing responsible work for the community but were demilitarized because they were black and became, it was scary for non-black people to fathom that the shift, it, there could be a shift. And that's all post-slavery trauma. 
a friend of mine I just want to share last week shared with me. And of course everything, I'm not into generalization, but it's interesting when we look at culture, he said to me, white people don't know how to carry pain the way people of color have been bred to carry pain. And so when they are angry, they lash out in ways that lack dignity. to be full of hatred. There are allies present here today or ones who are forming. But we need to understand our history and take all measures to ensure that this is a lasting change. America has been in slavery all this time. It just looks different now. do it. It's important that we do it and that people listen. I think next up we have someone who wanted to share some words from Martin Luther King. Uh, Justin, Justin Titus? Justin. Justin, I'm sorry. Justin. Justin and Titus, he wanted to give us some words of MLK. So would you please come up here and uh, let's share a message that was given in the 1960s but is more relevant today than I think maybe ever before. Hello, everyone. A lot of everyone's out here in this hot sun, but obviously it seems like everyone... Can you guys hear me? Alright, perfect, perfect. I was uh, distant from the mic. I was saying I'm really glad everyone's out here. You guys came out in this hot sun to stand for what you believe in, and it's beautiful that we have so many young faces and some old faces and faces of all ages, people of all colors, willing to stand here together because of what's happening in the black community and has been happening since the very beginning. I'm gonna, let's see where I'm gonna start with this. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna give you a little pro prologue. This country was originally supposed to be all equal, initially, when it was written in the Declaration of Independence. But why was it not equal? Because remember when it's, it's written in the Declaration of Independence that all men were supposed to be created equal, right? In the preamble. Now, George Washington and some of the other forefathers wanted to make sure that all slaves were equal during um, when they were going to free themselves from the British. But you know what happened? They realized that if they were to make that a possibility, the southern colonies would have to free their slaves. And that was really, would be really inconvenient for the southern half of the United States. So they chose not to do that because when they were fighting the British, it would have been an inconvenience in the war for the southern states to leave, the southern colonies to leave and join the British. So even in that, I think there's a, some kind of spiritual lesson that in there that they thought that maybe we can tackle the issue of racism maybe in another generation and just hope that things will get better because you know they were hoping that if they found an enlightened society, maybe things in the future would be better. But just what it was only a few hours ago, I found myself reading Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech. And I found something very shocking, completely alarming. I was blown away about almost how relevant his words from about, what, 1963 it's written, it's 2020, what's the math? Uh, almost 57 years ago, all right, is almost just as real, if not more relevant today. And I'm gonna begin the speech right now. If I could have someone willing to hold the mic for me, so I can only do both. Whoever gets there faster. <laughs> I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Is everyone familiar with that? What the Emancipation Proclamation is? The free the slaves? It's okay, don't be shy if you don't know. Um, but yes, that was the document that freed the slaves. This momentous decree is a great 
beacon of light, of hope to millions of Negro slaves who have been who have been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But a hundred years later, the Negro is still not free. One hundred years later, the life of the Negro is still badly crippled by the manacles of segregation. And today we are dealing with economic segregation, opportunity segregation, the treatment of what we receive from our government as a form of segregation is still here today. Um, 100 years badly crippled by manacles of segregation, chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of the ocean of material prosperity as one of the most prosperous countries in the world. And people forget, black people only make up 13% of this nation. So we really do live in a small island of poverty in a vast nation of prosperity. Um, so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir to. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be granted the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on that promissory note in so far as her citizens of color are concerned, instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great bulk of opportunity this nation has. So we've come to cash this check a check that will give us, upon demand, the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hollow spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of grandulism. Now is the time to make the real promise of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. And it's 2020, so sisterhood as well. Now is the time to make justice a reality of all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of this moment. This sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until this is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality in 1963, but it's 2020, and it, this is the summer of the Negro discontent. It is 2020. But hold up, I'm sorry, I'm not done. Give me a second. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship as rights as an equal citizen in this country. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundation of our nation until the bright days of justice emerge. And that is something that I must say to my people who stand on the worn threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Oh no, we must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to distrust all white people. Oh no, for many of our white brothers and sisters has, have, and has brought us by their presence here today have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom 
We cannot walk alone, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will we be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the, the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies are heavy with the fatigue of travel and not be lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. Yes, there's times people in the black community may sign up for an Airbnb and when they show up, they are not welcome to come there. That is still real here. We cannot be satisfied as long as Negroes' basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their adulthood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for rights only. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing which to vote for. No, 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 we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I'm not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have been battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue, continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to the South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation and will be will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of, of despair. I say to you today, my friends, though even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, and even let's not forget New Jersey has a deep history of racism and went once and maybe still is the headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan, was sweltering, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into a oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character why is that still a statement that we still have to remind ourselves it's almost 60 years later i have a dream that i that one day in alabama with its vicious racist with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification but today we have a president whose lips are dripping with the vicious words of decisive actions all of it. Well, one day that black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys, and little white girls, and sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. This is the faith we will be able to how out to hollow out the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land where of the pilgrims pride, from every mountainside let freedom ring. And if America is too to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the high new tops of Alganese of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of California. Let freedom ring from the canvas slopes 
Let freedom ring, but not only that, let freedom ring from the Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from the Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molotov of Mississippi. Yeah. Let freedom ring from the mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when all, all of our little freedom rings, and we will let it ring from every city and every hamlet, from every state and every speed up day, when we all of God's children, black men, white and, and white, Jew and Gentile, Protestant and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, great God almighty, we are free at last. I don't know who's Next, we have a special presentation of song. Hi everyone, I just want to thank everyone for coming out today in this blistering heat. I know y'all are hot, I know I am, but it's it means so much that you guys are still out here, still sitting with us, hearing our voices, and I wanted to thank you so much. And when this all happened, I'm a person that connects to music, especially in the town of South Plainfield. I live one block away from South Plainfield, so I spent my life from Plainfield and South Plainfield. I grew up in the um, school of Cedarbrook Elementary School, and I went there, and then I started to go to Sacred Heart School here, which is now known as Holy Trinity. And that was the first time I experienced the n-word being pulled to my face by a person of, that person is white and i feel that i need to show my voice today and i know as an artist how i can show my emotion lift every voice and sing till earth in heaven ring everyone to give Khalil a round of applause and everyone who has worked so hard to put this event together. We know that putting these things together is difficult. 
getting people to come out and to speak out about something so important, believe it or not, is not always easy. So it is a testament to you and to them that you are all here right now. And I want you to know that as a person who is older, much older than a lot of you, I am so proud of all of you. I am so proud of this coalition that you have put together that is multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-gendered, and all sorts of different sexual orientations, and somehow you've come together to galvanize around one thing, and that is justice. And I want you to know that it makes me proud to see how passionate you are about changing your world. I am so proud that you know that you have the power within yourselves to collectively change how we operate in this country. I can see that by all of the different people who are here that you have decided that you are going to make this world better for yourselves and for your children and for your children's children. And for that, I say thank you to you. Now I'm going to assume that just like we have a lot of different ethnicities here today, that we also have people who believe many different things. We have some people here right now who do not believe in God, who do not practice any sort of faith. So I'm not going to beat you over the head with a Bible. What I am going to tell you, however, is that the core of my faith is justice. I know I have heard so many on television. I heard Bill de Blasio and Cuomo and all of these mayors and governors all over the country telling people who are protesting right now that we can't have justice until we have peace. But my faith tells me that peace comes after justice. Justice yep. has to come first. And it is out of justice that peace flows and not just to those who have the power, not just to those who have the money, but to everyone. And so when you come out here demanding that there be justice, you are also ensuring that this world would have peace and peace that is true peace not just the peace that is quiet comfort from being uncomfortable. That peace that comes from not having to talk about race. That peace that comes from not having to talk about defunding the police. That peace that comes not just from talking about how we should all just love each other, but the peace that demands that we act on the love that we say that we have and that we root out those people who are not acting in love. Our call today is to demand that those in power understand that their power is a responsibility and not a right. A responsibility to care for all of humanity. A responsibility to provide safety for everyone. A responsibility to make sure that the wealth of this country is shared evenly and, uh, and, and in good faith. So I want to thank you for knowing something that it took me my whole life almost to learn. And that is that we are stronger together and that we need each other and that when we work together, we can change this world. And so I want to thank you for start making these steps towards changing this world. And I want to encourage you to not stop until you see the changes that are needed. The changes in healthcare, the changes in education, the changing in policing, the changing in who our leaders are. You guys can do it, and you're proving it right now. So, let us take a moment just to give thanks. And for those who don't believe, I apologize for placing my belief on the forefront, but I cannot hide it. 
Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all of these young adults that you have brought together in search of your peace. We thank you, God, that right now you are surrounding them with your protection. We thank you, God, that you are filling them with your wisdom. And we thank you, God, that you are preparing them to lead this world into a world of justice, of peace, and of love. So we ask, oh God, that as they continue forward, that you would guide them, that you would lead them, that you would be with them, that they may be able to change your world and make it a place where everyone lies in peace, has a full belly, a roof over their head, and never has to fear the violence of a corrupt system. We thank you, God, that even right now you are erasing the vestiges of racism, the vestiges of classism, the vestiges of sexism, the vestiges, O oh Lord, of hatred wherever it shows its head. And we thank you, God, that you are using your people to do it. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. But I pray, O oh Lord, on behalf of those who believe and do not believe. And so I say thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend. Thank you very much. Very, very, great work. So this vigil is a moment for us to just have some some quiet time to think and hold our candles and remember the lives of the names that we know: George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and for the names that we don't know. That list is longer than we probably can even imagine of the names of people who have been traumatized, abused, oppressed, and put down in many ways, not just physically sometimes, economically, spiritually, emotionally, put down by a system that has been oppressive to them. So we want to take this moment, just take a moment, be silent, be still, hold your candles, think about the brothers and sisters and all those whose lives have been affected, and also think about the change we have impacted today, coming out into a community and showing and sharing our voice. It's so important to share your voice. But right now, let's be quiet and just share a moment of solitude and thought. something so beautiful about silence, isn't it? Everybody can come together and be loud and make noise, which we did. And we made sure South Plainfield heard us from here all down Maple Ave, maintaining a municipal building for about 15, 20 minutes in totality. We, we, they heard our voice, but when we all can just be silent and just hear our own thoughts and hear nature, it's a beautiful thing. So thank you guys for coming out. I want to give a special thanks to Savannah, to Chris, lovely, Janae, Melissa, all those involved behind the scenes helping put this together. It was not easy work, but you guys definitely made it easier by showing your support. Thank you, Anthony, Mariah, Miranda, Anthony's brother. Thank you guys all so much for all your support. Those who ran the snack tables. Yeah, give them a round of applause. They gave us snacks, they got water, we had a megaphone. And we can make an impact, we can make a change. So this was a historic day in South Plainfield history. Never before has this been done, but I hope we can do it again. I hope we can do it again, and I know we can. Please go take some snacks home, take some bagels home. There's plenty of water 
Uh, if anybody else is hungry or thirsty, I know you're going to be hungry later. So just take some snacks home. Um, we, again, appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you for the support. Please share your photos with us. Share your stories. You know, you can follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Share pictures with us. Share your stories. You know, don't let this just be this moment. This is going to be something we're going to keep going to until until things are better. And even when they're better, we got we can't let up. It's something we have to just keep keep pushing, keep pushing, marching forward. So again, thank you guys, and this has been really really great. So have a have a blessed rest of the day. Enjoy your week, and uh, let's again let's not let this be a moment. This is a movement.